Okay, so this is take two of my talk t on infinity categories, um, where I'm going to be describing the model for infinity categories via weak Kahn complexes. Um, now, take one went well, um, it was fine on Discord, and uh, everyone was happy apparently. But the problem was that um, the screen, the OBS recording itself was recording about a quarter of my screen. So, I mean, to upload it would have been completely absurd because, like, it wasn't like the homotopy theory talk where a little bit was cut off. Um, you know, tons of it was cut off. So, so that's not good at all. So, uh, I'm just going to be re recording. Um, uh, but this time, instead of some friends on Discord, I have a bagel and some water to keep me company. Uh, so yeah, let's proceed. So, so again, so following the notation used by Jacob Lurie, I'm going to be denoting the models of infinity 1 categories by infinity categories, because I'm not going to be needing infinity 2 categories or whatever, and the infinity 0 categories are just called um, infinity groupoids. Here I should mention the two references, the two main references um, that I used were higher topos theory by Lurie and um, a short course. And this was a more this was a more expository paper rather than a big book. This was a short course on infinity categories. by M. Groth. Um, so those are the two main references, but apart from that we have no problems proceeding. So what the plan for the talk is going to be is, first I'm going to give some introduction and motivation using the fundamental infinity groupoid, then I'm going to go on to some basics of infinity categories. Now this is going to constitute into three parts, so some basics of simplicial sets, the definition of an infinity category itself, and then we're going to make the plan, which we're going to lay out in the introduction, precise. And then after that, I'm going to go over like a little, very brief overview of some uh, higher algebra and good willy calculus. Um, but also, I'm just going to mention that, you know, you can actually do in c constructions on infin con infinity categories like functors and curlimps and whatnot. So before I begin the talk, I'd like to start off by giving a rough sketch of the fundamental infinity group. Um, but before I do this, um, I feel that it would be nice to motivate the fundamental infinity groupoid via the fundamental groupoid. Now, what the fundamental groupoid of a space is, is just, is just um, a, a groupoid whose objects are points in X, and the morphisms are just homotopy classes of parts between two points, and they're relative to base points. Now, all of these parts admit an inverse up to homotopy, so it's a groupoid. But because it only depends on the one type of x, it discards a lot of information, and the better in the better version is the fundamental infinity groupoid. And this is what we're going to be des describing roughly. The objects are roughly, so this is a rough description, but the objects are going to be given by points in x. The morphisms are parts between x and y. The two morphisms are given by homotopies between the parts. And the higher morphisms are given by higher homotopies. So two morphisms, all this means is morphisms between morphisms. And higher morphisms is obviously the morphisms between the higher morphisms. Um, so for example, three morphisms would be uh, morphisms between two morphisms, and so forth. And those higher morphisms are given by higher homotopies, so homotopies between the homotopies. So these are these morphisms here are invertible in a weak sense, so up to higher homotopies, these are invertible. And so this leads me on to my next point nicely. So category theory, while it is useful, of course you've probably seen some use of it somewhere, it does have limitations. It's not unlimited power, um, you can just translate anything into category theory. One of these main limitations is that Two objects which aren't isomorphic but are weakly equivalent in the homotopy theoric sense, we sometimes want to consider as isomorphic. But just using category theory, there's no notion of weak equivalence. It's either isomorphic or not isomorphic. Um, 
and so that's a problem, right? We what we want to we want to model stuff in homotopy theory too, but we can't do that yet that well. And so homotopy theory, I mean, category theorists and homotopy theorists, they aren't going to just sit around, you know, bagel in hand, mm, just um, doing nothing. They're gonna they're gonna want to solve this problem. And so one of the main ways to solve this problem is via infinity one categories. And by the way, another example of um, um, a setting where it's desirable to consider things up to weak isomorphism, if you'd like to say it that way, is in homological algebra, where it's desirable to consider chain complexes up to quasi-isomorphism, not just isomorphism. Um, so yeah. So the, the five main techniques for a pair um, consisting of the category and weak equivalences um, include model categories, derivatives, simplicial categories, and topological categories. And uh, these all constitute to the theory of infinity one categories. Um, and so I think that's what the next slide is going to show. Um, so the information that we want in an infinity one category is as follows. First of all, we want a class of objects, so that's just like a normal category. The morphisms, we want morphisms between these objects. We want two morphisms between the morphisms. We want three morphisms between the two morphisms. We want four morphisms between the three morphisms, and so on and so on. And that explains why there's an affinity in the name, because we want four morphisms, we want three morphisms, uh, sorry, we want four morphisms, we want five morphisms, and so forth. We want morphisms to be composed in an associative and unital way, which is normal. We want higher morphisms to be invertible, at least up to higher morphisms, which corresponds to the one part of the name. And the reason it corresponds to the one part of the name is because, if you'll notice, um, it's not included. Yeah. Um, so that's good. Um, so that's the plan. This is the these are the guiding principles that we that what what we want in an infinity one category. Okay, but this is hard to make precise, right? So, what exactly do we mean, like invertible up to higher morphisms? You know, phrases like homotopy theoretic sense and so forth. Um, what do we actually mean by all of this? Well, that's what we're going to make precise, and to do so, recall the following principle in higher category theory, known as the homotopy hypothesis. And it roughly, well, roughly, what it says is that spaces and homotopy, uh, sorry, spaces and infinity groupoids should be the same. Now, how are we gonna? Okay, so we have the homotopy theory. Sorry, we have the homotopy hypothesis in hand, in mind. We have our guiding principles in mind from before. But now we want to convert all of this into a plan, and then we want to um, make that plan, plan into a reality. So first what we're going to do is we're going to use simplicial models for spaces, namely Kahn, Kahn complexes. And um, this is going to turn out to be an easier framework to um, put infinity categories in than just topological spaces. Then, in this framework, we want to formalize infinity categories. And to do so, we're going to define infinity categories as simplicial sets, satisfying certain Horn extension properties. And this will all seem very motivated once we get to it, and it's all going to make sense once we get to it. And now infinity groupoids should be the same as Kahn complexes by the homotopy hypothesis. And then with this approach to infinity categories, we get a model for the fundamental infinity groupoid, which turns out to be the singular complex um, of a space X. While we mull over this plan, uh, I'm just going to take a quick bite out of my bagel. So, so the reason I chose now to take a bite out of my bagel, it's not just because I was hungry, it's because this is a really important slide and I want you to have this in the back of your mind while we're going through each stage of the process. So yeah. So we're going to go through some basics of simplicity or sets, the definition of an infinity category after this, and then we're going to see how we've made the plan precise. Okay, so first we need some prerequisites, namely simplicity or sets. So 
So we denote by delta the simplicial category, where the objects are given by totally ordered sets, these ordinals here, um, given by this, and order preserving functions or morphisms. So this this means strictly order preserving in this case, which means that A is less than B implies that F of A is less than F of B. Whereas weakly, and this is different to weakly order preserving because weakly would mean that A is less than or equal to B implies that F of A is less than or equal to F of B. That's not what we want, we want this version here. Um, but that's just a slight little notational remark. And now, a simplicial set is just the contravariant functor between the simplicial category and the category of sets. And a co-simplicial set, which is something that we're not going to use, but it's just the dual notion, which I thought, you know, I might as well include. It's just given by co- is a covariant functor between the simplicial category and the category of sets. Now we define the maps, um, di, and this, this should actually be from n to n minus 1. Um, as the unique injective map which skips i in its image. So, if we have something like um, like this, then it's going to map to 0, and then it's going to miss out i, basically. Uh, you know, yeah, it's going to miss out i, basically. Um, and so it's a map between uh, n and this ordinal n minus 1. And similarly, the degeneracy maps are the unique surjections between uh, this ordinal n minus 1 and n. And what it's going to do is it's going to include i in its image twice. Um, so yeah, that might be slightly confusing just because I mixed up the um, letters here, but hopefully, hopefully that's not too confusing. And if you'd like, you can try to come up with an explicit description of these face and degeneracy maps using piecewise functions. Although it's not too important, it's just if you, um, you know, if you want to think about these really explicitly. Now, recall that x is a simplicial set, it's just a contravariant functor. So, so we're going to have elements x of n, but, that, but we're just going to denote it as xn. <coughs> and these are going to be sets. And they're called n simplices. And xn, this notation is just much simpler than x of n. And, and similarly, we write d sub i for x at the uh, face map di, and sj for x at the degeneracy map sj. So, actually what we can do is we can use face and degeneracy maps to rewrite the definition of a simplicial set. So, the old category theoretical definition was really neat, but then again, this definition here is also um, quite important. These simplicity identities can be manipulated in such a way that it's uh, in, in a useful way sometimes, and so that it's nice to have this definition too. So a simplicial set, alternatively, is a collection of sets, along with maps di and si between x, n, and x maps xn minus 1 and xn and xn plus 1, such that they satisfy these simplicity identities. While you read over these identities, I'm just going to take another bite out of my bagel. Okay, that should be enough time to um, read through these identities. Um, so now we proceed. So the standard n simplex is given by the set of morphisms between n and n. So, for example, the standard 2 simplex is just going to be a triangle given like this. So this is going to be d1, this is going to be d0, this is going to be d2, like this. And the face maps are just going to be the map opposite to this. And this is opposite that, and this is opposite this. So, uh, let's just get rid of that. Um, okay, so, some jargon here, before we proceed. 
Um, iota sub n is just the identity um, map here. The boundary is just given by the smallest subcomplex of delta n, which contains all of the faces. Um, so that that's a pretty intuitive definition, right? Um, we want the boundary to just contain the faces. That makes sense. And the case n horn is given. Now it says informally, but really it's it's just formal enough, really, for the rest of the talk. We're not going to need the co-equalizer definition. It's given informally by the category which is generated by all of the faces, but it misses out on the case face. And so if you want to be, if we want to get really like nitty gritty into the details, it's given by this co-equalizer here. But again, this one is more than good enough for what we're going to be doing next. And horns are quite important in this talk, so if this is good enough, then it, then it, you know, if I say it's good enough, then it probably is pretty precise itself. So typically, so just to get a feel for what for horns are, we, for comparison, this is the um, uh, standard two simplex. Then the z then the zero n horn, two horn, would just be this angle here. And it's going to miss out on this face here, because this is the face d0, because it's opposite 0. So that's what it's missing out on. And it's obviously a subset of the standard 2 simplex. And if you'd like, you can similarly represent... And sorry, um, this slide went differently. Um, this this would actually be... Um, this actually the answer for k equals 1. This is the um, uh, first 2 simplex because it's missing out on the um, d1 here. This is what it's missing out on. Um, okay. So now we're gonna switch focus. So that's the um, simplicial set, that's kind of the simplicial set terminology notation type of thing out of the way. So we're gonna switch focus to the nerve functor. And so given a category C, we can form a simplicial set, which is called the nerve of the category. What it's going to be is, it's going to be the set of, uh, so it's going to be the simplicial set where the, ends, the n simplices are given by the, uh, the, uh, the simplicial set of functors between, um, the simplicial set of functors between this ordinal n and the category C. The nerve functor is fully faithful, and so it includes an image, it includes an equivalence of categories on its essential image. And so, what, of course, what we're going to what we're going to want to do is study the essential image. And what we're going to do to do this is study certain horn extension properties of the nerve functor. So, this so let's write C M for the image of M under a horn alpha. And this is going to make the horns, um, the, the case n horns for k between 0 and 2 look like this. So again, this is missing out on the, this is missing out on d0, so that's why it's going to look like that. This is, this is missing out on c1, and this is, uh, this is missing out on, uh, on d2. So that's why they look like this. But now notice something. Notice that the only one where we can really expect a unique composition is this one, because we can just define it as um, G composed with F, right? We, that's just a unique composition. Um, whereas for these, whereas for the outer horns, so lambda um, two zero and lambda two two. You can't really expect such a thing because these two arrows we can't really compose them, and so for the inner, for the inner horns, we have a unique two simplex which it looks like, and the diagram will look like this, and this is for the first um, two horn. Um, so yeah, as I said before, the the horns lambda n k, where k 
k is between 0 and n are called inner horns, whereas the ones that extreme examples for lambda uh, n0 and lambda n n, they're called outer horns. So, so I don't have to keep um, repeating myself that way. Um, so if x is a simplicial set, then x is the nerve of a category if and only if every single inner horn can be uniquely extended to an n simplex um, can be uniquely extended to an n simplex um, uh, using the standard uh, n simplex here um, and um, x is some x is isomorphic to a group at uh, the nerve of a groupoid if and only if every single horn so not every inner horn, but if every horn can be uniquely extended to an n simplex. And so now we're going to study what's called Kahn complexes, which is the characterization of the essential image of the nerve functor between groupoids and sets. And a simplicial set X is said to be a Kahn complex if every horn can be extended to an n simplex. So this is every horn. So Need not doesn't have to be an inner horn. It can also be an outer horn too. So that's a good advantage. Um, so that's nice. So and also we have this diagram of fully faithful functors here, um, where the vertical arrows are given by nerves, and then because the uh, all groupoids are categories, it's Obviously, a subset and all common complex uh, simplicity sets. So, those maps there are going to be the obvious maps. And so, we arrive finally at the definition of an infinity category. We say that simplicial set C is an infinity category if every single inner horn can be extended to an n simplex. Let's hold on, hold on, let's wait. We're combining the two horn extension properties of the nerve, of the nerve and the Kahn complexes. Those they both satisfy certain horn extension properties, and what we're doing is we're combining, um, we're combining them into one definition. So note that there are two major differences between the horn extension properties of Kahn complexes and nerves. For Kahn complexes, all horns can be extended, but for nerves, it's only the case for inner horns. Furthermore, for Kahn complexes, just the existence of such an extension is required, but for nerves, the extension has to be unique. So, the nerve in that case, in this sense, is more category theoretical, rather than uh, because it has to be a unique extension. But because we're in infinity categories, because we're working in infinity categories, we only need existence. Because we want all of the choices of the compositions to be homotopically irrelevant. And so this is similar similar to concatenating parts in a space X. Um, so, we, uh, yeah, we don't really care what choice of composition we make um, up to homotopy. Okay. So I'll give some examples of infinity categories. Any Kahn complex will be an infinity category, and so for any space X, its singular complex will be an infinity category. Also, one can say that all categories should be infinity categories. Why? Because the higher morphisms can just be given by the identity. And so, that's kind of cheating, but then again, you're not wrong if you say that. And the nerve allows us to make this idea precise. So what we do is, we identify a category to its nerve, and then that allows us to study categories as a special case of higher category theory. So we need some, you know, jargon, we need some... Um, uh, terminology. So the objects of a category, an infinity category, are just the vertices, 
since, by the way, there isn't what C0 is, remember that C0, this is still a simplicial set. So we're still using that type of notation. Um, the one simplicies are morphisms. The face map, which we're going to call S, um, the face map D1, which we're calling S, is the source map. And the face map D0, which we're going to call T, is the target map. We write a morphism F between X and Y if the source of F is equal to X and the target of F is equal to Y. And so if we're being like really precise and all category theoretical, we write HOM of XY as the following pullback, um, to be really precise about things. And so we write S0 um, for the identity map. Okay, so now with this terminology and stuff out of the way, we're finally in a position to define homotopies in infinity categories. And so now we can slowly start to see the plan coming together and becoming precise once and for all. Because remember that we want homotopies to be precise. We want that as one of the main things holding us back from making infinity categories precise. And so in this model, what we want is to describe homotopies, ver verify that homotopies are an actual equivalence relation. And what we want to do after this is describe the homotopy category of an infinity category. Oh, sorry, I forgot that actually good definition. We say that two morphisms are homotopic if there's a two simplex sigma with the boundary, so that is d0 of sigma is going to be g, d, um, d1 of sigma is going to be f, and d2 is going to be degenerate. And so the boundary will look like this. And so the first thing that we're going to want to verify is that this is an equivalence relation. Okay, so first we showed that um, it is reflexive. So if we consider an edge, F, then there are two simplices, sigma and sigma prime, such that d0 of sigma and d2 of sigma prime are degenerate. So we're just going to focus on sigma here. So this diagram, so we're letting sigma equal to S0 of F. So what we're going to want is we have that um, we have that D. So if, if sigma is equal to S0 of F and D2 of sigma is equal to f, d1 of sigma is equal to f, uh, and the d0 is degenerate, and for this one here, we have that the d2 here is degenerate as well. Um, so that's good, so we, so these are homotopies between F and itself and themselves. Um, but now we have a home. Okay, now we're going to have symmetry, and these are more clean proofs, if you ask me. Um, so if we have a homotopy sigma between G and F, by the previous part of the proof, there's a homotopy H F between F and F, <coughs> and so we have a horn, um, a three horn, which is given by the solid arrows, where this is the homo, this two simplex here is given by the homotopy between F and itself. This is given by F and G, the homotopy between F and G. And then this right, and then this arrow right here, um, is the extension that we have, the unique extension that we have since we're in an infinity category. And so that extension gives us a new simplex, two simplex, which will look like this. Um, and that means, and this is a homotopy between G and F. And now actually, 
Um, I forgot to remove this. But actually, symmetry in this case is just a special case of the proof of transitivity. Because all we have to do is... Whoops. All we have to do is replace the HF, which was here, which was a homotopy between H and F, with um, a homotopy between G and H. And so if we put G here and F here, because that's what I meant to write, um, we have a homotopy here between F and G, we have a homotopy here between G and H, and then this D1, which extends the, um, which extends the three horn, gives us a homotopy between H and F. And so transitivity is shown. Now, another definition is compositions of morphisms. So this is, um, is how we compose morphisms. And we could have written our proofs um, in terms of these compositions of morphisms if we wanted to. Um, but how do we define it? So, if F and G are morphisms in an arbitrary infinity category C, then to compose the two morphisms, we form an inner horn in C, um, which would be denoted like this, so that D0 of the horn is G and D2 of the horn is F. And now, to re-emphasize, this horn can be non-uniquely extended to a tune simplex. So unlike in infinity category, where I mean in normal category theory, where we'd require that this is a unique extension, this is non-uniquely extended to a two-simplex sigma, and the new face of sigma d1 is called a candidate composition of g and f. Okay, actually, let me just um, go back a slide um, just to let you mull on this a little bit. Okay, so, this is different from normal category theory, right? Because we don't require this composition to be unique. To re-emphasize, all we require in higher category theory is that all of these candidate compositions are weakly equivalent in the homotopy theoretic sense. And so we shall now form the homotopy category of an infinity category, and show that it's well defined, and what we're going to do to form it is by passing everything down to homotopy classes. Um, so now that we have a well defined homotopy relation, we may pass, we may form the homotopy category of an infinity category. Again, as I said, by passing everything down to homotopy classes. So we have to show th various different things um, to show that this is actually a well defined category, but the main thing which we're going to show, which we're going to satisfy ourselves by showing, is that every candidate composition of two morphisms um, are indeed homotopic. So this is what this theorem is basically saying. And here's how it goes. So consider the diagram um, given by solid arrows. So this is a, a one, the first three, simple, uh, three horn given by the solid arrows, and this extends to a three simplex tau, um, as pictured, which is the horn including this face D1. Now, let's unpack this horn a little bit more. This was a candidate composition of GNF, this is another candidate composition of GNF, and D1 is giving a homotopy between H and H prime, the two candidate compositions. So that's what's going on in this diagram here. So now that we've verified, well, partially verified it, <coughs> excuse me, then we can, we can form an ordinary category called the homotopy category of C, which has the following data. The objects are just given by the objects of C, the infinity category, but the morphisms are given by homotopy classes of maps in C. The composition and identities respectively are the class of G composed of the class of F is just the class of G composed F, where this is just some arbitrary candidate composition because they're all going to be homotopically equivalent anyway, and the identity is just given by the class of the degeneracy 
um, map. And so now, after 75 slides of work, we're finally ready to make this plan precise that I had to memorize while I was munching on a bagel. We can finally do something about this plan and see how we've put it all together with this work. The first principle which one is, composition of f and g exists, but that any two choices of such compositions are homotopic. So the space of such compositions has trivial pi zero. The homotopies that compare the two choices are homotopic, trivial pi one. And we can do this so the homotopies that compare the homotopies that compare the homotopies are also homotopy. And so on and so on and so on for high homomorphisms, and that means trivial pi i for i bigger than 2, or equal to 2. And those are higher homotopy groups. Now what we also want is morphisms of higher dimensions. So just a quick notational remark is that if we have vertices in a, the standard n simplex, then we can denote by delta to these vertices the k simplex of delta n, which is spanned by these vertices. Now, we can define an n-morphism between x and y, and this is given as a map of simplicial sets, and before I go further, I don't think I've introduced what this is, but because simplicial sets are just functors, the natural way to do it is just a natural transformation, like so. Um, so that's what I mean by a map of simplicial sets, such that, I mean tau, between delta n plus 1, the standard n plus 1 simplex, and the infinity category C, such that when you restrict tau to the n simplex spanned by the vertices 0 to n, you get x, and when you restrict tau to the um, to the n plus 1 simplex, to the n plus 1 simplex, sorry, the 1 simplex um, spanned by the vertices n plus 1, you get y. Now, the following theorem of Joy al convinces ourselves that we have actually done the first part of our plan. And Joy al, by the way, um, they are very influential in this field. Um, they have done a bunch of work on this infinity categories, and other notable mathematicians in this field would probably include Jacob Lurie, um, Emily Real, and that type of thing, um, who studied infinity categories in great depth. Um, um, so what's this theorem saying? It's saying that a simplicial set X is an infinity category if and only if the restriction map I star, um, which you can see here is from between these two mapping spaces, is an acyclic Kahn vibration. What? Before you go on to NLAB, looking at all of these category theoretic definitions, don't worry, I'm actually going to unpack this theorem a bit. So you can think of this mapping space here as the space of all composition problems, whereas this mapping space here is the space of all solutions to the composition problems. What the theorem is actually telling us is that the defining feature of an infinity category is that these two spaces are homotopically equivalent. Furthermore, if we have two morphisms f and g which are composable in an infinity category c, then what we can do is we can form a horn, an inner horn here, which is a vertex. It's just a vertex um, in the solution uh, in this um, solution of composition problems. Now the fibre of I star over the vertex can be thought of as the space of possible compositions of X, F and G, which, by the theorem, tell is a contractible Kahn complex. And because it's contractible, obviously it's going to have trivial homotopy groups. And that's the information that we wanted in the first place. Now, because we we can we can just you know we've done we've established now that we can just say composition instead of candidate composition. Um, 
So now we can deal with equivalences in an infinity category, um, C. A morphism is an equivalence if the class of F is an, is an isomorphism in this normal category, um, the homotopy category of C. And now we're getting ready to loop all the way back around to infinity group voids. But first we need a definition, right? Uh, the homotopy hypothesis will tell us that infinity group voids should come from spaces. But first we need a definition of an infinity group void. Which is just, it's a very natural definition. I mean, it's the definition that you'd expect having done this groundwork. Which is just that an infinity category is an infinity group void if the homotopy category is a group void. Oh, whoops, I think I went the wrong direction. And now the following theorem of Joyal says that all horns can be extended for an infinity category <coughs> as soon as certain maps are equivalences. So if we have an infinity category C, any horn, um, any uh, horn here, such that n is bigger than 2, and that lambda restricted to um, this um, 2 simplex here is an equivalence. I forgot to write that, but um, okay. Can be extended to an n simplex um, there. And, and you can give a similar statement for the outer horn, the other outer horn, um, lambda n, 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 n horn. And so, and now a corollary of this is the homotopy hypothesis. Which is, an infinity category is an infinity groupoid if, and only if, it is a Kahn complex. And so, to sum up all of the work that we've done in these, in this big bulk, say 50 slides, 60 slides, mass amount of work that we've done, summarize it a little bit, we can refine our original diagram of fully faithful functors to look like this. Whoops. And so that's pretty much all of the work that I had to do done. Um, now, what next is a really short overview of a couple of extra topics called higher higher algebra and good willy calculus along with just basically me telling you that in that you can do categorical constructions in infinity categories too um so the most natural thing to talk about are one categorical constructions but just on infinity categories and these have been studied, of course, and now we can speak comfortably about co-limits in infinity categories. And again, the main reference for this would probably be higher topos theory. If you, if, if you want to um, actually look at the details of this. Um, and that's, that's nice because co-limits are an important um, topic in one category theory. So, of course, it's natural to study them in an infinity categorical setting, too. Now, higher algebra. So, the idea of... So, we can phrase algebra, normal algebra, in terms of normal category theory. For example, we have the category of abelian groups, for example. Higher algebra is studying algebra, but, but in the context of higher categories. So we're moving up a level to higher categories, and then we're going to study the associated algebraic structures. So the main, one of the main objects are called E-infinity rings. And roughly there are space X, which satisfy the ring up axioms up to coherent homotopy. E-infinity rings can be thought of as playing the same role in stable homotopy theory as commutative rings do in algebra. And so the collection of all spectra, which are just um, the infinity categorical version of abelian groups, can actually be arranged into an infinity category. And the, the analogy goes a little bit deeper because the tensor product on abelian groups has the analogue of the smash product in higher algebra. 
And one can, for example, introduce the notion of a stable infinity category. So this is a really like basic notion in higher algebra. Um, and essentially what it is, is it's an axiomization of an essential principle in stable homotopy theory, which is that fiber sequences and cofiber sequences are the same in stable homotopy theory. And furthermore, the, the infinity category of spectra are an example of a stable infinity category. And if this has piqued your interest somewhat, um, it, it, the theory, of course, goes a lot deeper than what I've said, but um, a really big, chunky resource for it, but a good resource, the main resource is Higher Algebra, again by Lurie. Uh, and so the last thing to talk about is Goodwilly Calculus. And this is a categorification of differential calculus. And what it's used to do is study functors that arise in topology. So the theory starts with the categorification of polynomial functions called n excessive functors, Pn of f. And Goodwillies established that every single homotopy functor, f, has a universal approximation by these functors. So what this tower is going to look like is we're going to have... Um, we're going to have, uh, duh, 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 and then we're going to have um, PNF here, and then we're going to keep going down duh, 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 to P1 of F, and F is going to be going, you know, all the way uh, here, like this. So that's what the tower is going to look like. Um, or more simply, more simply, if you would like, you can have uh, F. Duh, 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 we can have PNF, and we can keep going to P1 of F. I think actually there's P0 of F2. Um, but okay. But there's a really interesting example. Okay, sorry for sorry for like uh, just drawing some weird diagrams. But there's a really interesting example. You would think the identity functor would be trivial in this context, right? But actually, it's a really interesting example of what's going on here. One excessive functors represent generalized homology theories, roughly. Now consider the identity functor on the category-based spaces. In the Goodwilly calculus, this functor is actually really non-trivial. P1 of the identity functor on some space x is the infinite loop of the infinite suspension of x. And it represents stable homotopy theory in the sense that the homotopy ring of the infinity uh, of this thing right here is isomorphic to the stable homotopy ring of the space X. And actually, as you go higher and higher up the tower, these PN of the identities will just interlope between stable, unstable, stable, unstable homotopy theory, and it's just going to be satisfying various versions of the excision axiom, which is really cool in my opinion. But yeah, thank you guys for watching. Um, I'm sorry to the people who are there on the um, on the. Di I mean, actually, no, I'm not sorry to the people on Discord server because you could see the stream just fine live. Um, but unfortunately, I c uh, the recording of that one got messed up. So hopefully, this one is fine. Hopefully, you can see the screen properly. Hopefully, it's helped you understand infinity categories a bit better. Um, and yeah, thank you for watching, and hopefully, I'll see you guys in the next video. Um, yeah, see ya. And uh, during the Discord server, the link, if not in the description, will definitely be, um, sorry, um, in the, in my about section, it's always there. So, hopefully, I'll see you guys in the Discord server, and hopefully maybe one of you can give a talk here. Anyway, thank you for watching. Goodbye.